hello everybody and uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this well a few moments ago rainy afternoon but now it actually uh, looks better uh, to hear about uh, our pride and joy the network of the european digital innovation hubs uh, the objective of this session today is uh, really to present uh, you the network and what actually they do and how they can be of support. And uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to say that I'm uh, joined today uh, by Lisa, uh, Lynn Rosa André and Benjamin Castier from Luxembourg who will uh, present to us uh, how they are reaching out to industry so that they uh, use the services of their uh, hub. Uh, then we will hear from Erwin van Eyden and Jurian Helmus uh, from a Dutch uh, hub NWNL um, on how they deploy AI and data to help companies. And our last presentation will be from Barbara Kodmaite and Ruta Gavalina from PPMI who worked for us on a study called Industrial Remoting. Uh, which actually followed a small company from a very, very non-digital sector in, uh, in Lithuania. And uh, they will explain how they helped this company and how, what kind of um, uh, results they achieved uh, on, the digital, on the digital pathway for them. So without further ado, uh, let me give you a brief explanation what the hubs are. So, imagine that uh, you are a, an owner of a small manufacturing company somewhere in southern Romania. For example, you produce uh, windows like the Velux uh, that we see in many of our houses. You are digitalized up to a certain extent. Uh, you have a website, uh, you, you use uh, your social media, um, you have obviously some kind of accounting program, uh, you try to reach out to your, uh, to your clients and uh, keep a database and keep them up to date with your latest products. But you feel that you really, really could do more with all the technologies that are are out there to be used. You heard about chat GPT and the magic it can do. Uh, you heard about AI. Uh, you heard about uh, high performance computing. Maybe you heard also about quantum 5G and basically you are a little bit lost. Your biggest problem is you have no time. You have no time and you don't have also the funds to invest in many different technologies to, uh, to see what could work for you. In that situation, a hub is an ideal solution. They are there to help any company, small or, uh, or a mid-cap or a public service with exactly these questions. So first of all, they can help with uh, improving the skills of the owners of the company, of the employees, uh, improving various types of skills needed for the uh, today's digital world. Secondly, they can help with networking. They can link the company to other, um, to other companies, to institutions, to research organizations that can help them progress. They can provide them with funding advice. They not only can uh, help with uh, investment uh, and banks and things like that, but they can also help them get funding from the European funds, for example. And their... Uh, their um, most, uh, their best tool in their arsenal, the, the thing that really differ differentiates the hubs from other uh, similar uh, institutions and organizations around is the test before invest. So a hub can help a company to really find a solution that will work for them. So if you are this uh, Romanian producer of Windows, they will look for what solution uh, and which technological tool will work best for you, for your specific situation. This is also another uh, beauty of the hubs. They are local. As you can see on the map, we have currently 151 hubs and they are located in each EU member state as well as uh, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. And very soon we will also have hubs in the associated countries. This is because we really want the hubs to be available for this local support. They know the local language, they know the local uh, rules and regulations, and they know the local ecosystem. Therefore, they can best address uh, the needs of the local companies. 
But what if your company has needs that exceed the capacity of the hub? Well, nothing to worry about. That's why we have the network. The hub can reach out to his, uh, their fellow hubs who probably will have these needed capacities and they can put the company in contact with this other hub that will provide this highly specialized uh, service. And uh, this is all nice and, 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 and fun, but you say, okay, but in reality, we are not owners of a Romanian company producing uh, windows. So why are we interested in this? What is in there for us? Well, the hubs are specializing in almost every technology that our DG uh, has ever been dealing with or could invent uh, to, to deal with it in the future. So if you need any feedback or any information from what the companies on the ground that, uh, that work with the given technology need or, uh, or have problems with, the hubs could be your contact point. You can reach out and get feedback of what is actually happening on the ground in the different countries. In addition, they also can serve us as a way to pass information. We don't have to rely on, um, on only, uh, um, for example, uh, general uh, information that we are passing through about our legislation or about our programs. Through the hubs, we can directly reach to company to explain what certain rules and regulation would, for example, mean for them. And uh, finally, they can also give us feedback of what is happening and how uh, our actions are being perceived. So without further ado, let me now pass the floor directly to our Luxembourgish colleagues who will explain how they are working and how they are reaching the companies on the ground with their services. Uh, so Lynn Rose, please take the floor. Uh, Lynn, I think we, you are still muted. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now it's perfect. Sorry about that. Round two. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I've already been so kindly introduced, uh, my name is Lynn Rosa Andre. I'm a project coordinator at Lux Innovation, working at the Luxembourg Digital Innovation Hub. And I'm also joined by Benjamin Kessier, who is our director for RDI support and digital transformation. I would like to start off with expressing my heartfelt gratitude for being given the opportunity to present our ADIH or EDI um, today to you, the Luxembourg Innovation Hub, or LDIH for short, and our activities in industry outreach to you today. Before I get to that, um, Allow me just a few brief moments to introduce the LDIH Consortium. Uh, we are made up of five partners. Uh, as I mentioned, both of us present today are from Lux Innovation, Luxembourg's um, National Innovation Agency, which is committed to supporting companies of any size in their activities related to innovation, research and development, sustainability, and digitalization. We are also the coordinators of our EDI. Then our consortium also consists of the LIST, the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, a research and technology organization uh, working across three pillars, informatics, materials and environment as well, the University of Luxembourg, as well as the competence center of the University of Luxembourg, which is focused on delivering high quality trainings. And last but not least, the Luxembourg House of Cybersecurity, which deliver support and tools for companies to increase their cyber resilience and to respond to incidents directly. We are serving Luxembourg's manufacturing industry with unique competences in high performance computing, in um, cybersecurity and in AI. As was already mentioned, uh, cross-border cooperation with other eddies is very important. So um, we also have established a cooperation agreement with other eddies of the greater region, that is Condest in France, Bologna in Belgium, uh, Saarland and Rhineland-Palatinate in Germany. 
which also all target the same sector, so manufacturing. I, we believe that this cooperation agreement shows our continued commitment to cross-border cooperation as it is indispensable to our economy and society in general here in Luxembourg, but also in the greater region. We're here today to talk to you about our activities in industry outreach. But before we can effectively reach out to our local ecosystem, we first have to get to know it. So that was our motivation when we created this industry and ecosystem mapping. As you can see, it not only includes the manufacturing sector, so our target audience, but also enablers. That is because in order to effectively serve our community, we have to have a holistic understanding of all its participating actors and activities. The focus of the eddies is local impact. So knowing about the specificity of our local ecosystem ensures that we establish data-driven initiatives that do have an impact and that do address the needs of our community. This interactive mapping, by the way, is available on, is freely available on our website and is a snapshot of Luxembourg's uh, manufacturing ecosystem. We plan to update it uh, with time, with more relevant data, maybe also with data on digital maturity, perhaps, um, observe its evolution across time, and then, of course, respond to it. Our activities in industry outreach are centered on three main axes, which are distinguished by the number of people we are addressing. Those are one to many, one to few, and one to one, which are mainly our service offerings. This fits with our funnel like approach of informing, inspiring, and then engaging our community with specific services uh, in our catalog. Additionally, this organic approach builds up the trust that is necessary for clients to go from first contact to service delivery, especially thinking about SMEs. Here are some examples of outreach activities that we do. We host a webinar series called the LDIH Talks that we host all year round, once a month, on an Industry 4.0 topic. These always feature one local company with a real practical use case presenting to their peers how they have overcome a specific challenge or how they are using a given digital solution. Our most popular sessions from this year were a trilogy on how to transform data into information that went from the actual data collection to using an AI to enhance the value of the data extracted. Most recently, we had an episode about design thinking methodology, which was at the specific request of our community, which leads me to another activity that we do is regular surveys, um, where we gather the ideas and input from our community in order to help us shape future offerings. In terms of events, we also co-organize Luxembourg's biggest um, Industry 4.0 event, which is the Smart Manufacturing Week, that includes two days of conferences, inspiring talks, keynotes, factory tours offered by local companies, as well as ample opportunity for networking, also in collaboration with the Enterprise Europe Network, for example. Then there is one initiative that I would like to present to you in more detail, and that is our flagship event, the DIH on Tour. Started in 2021, the DIH on Tour is an event where we rent this very eye-catchy yellow American school bus, type of vehicle you don't really ever see on Luxembourg roads, and we go to different industrial zones across the country and we meet manufacturing companies at their location. With Luxembourg being a smaller country as it is, we are able to do this across the whole of the country. The bus is a special bus normally used for dinner hopping events. So it is equipped with tables, it is equipped with screens, a bar, it can act as a networking platform, as well as a bit out of the ordinary location to uh, host um, keynotes and talks and presentations. 
The first year we piloted this type of event, we visited around 12 industrial zones um, with participants coming from big companies as well as SMEs. And it provided mainly a platform for networking um, to happen. It also helped get on hub known in the local ecosystem, also through considerable social media impact, for example. The bus is really quite eye-catching. In last year's editions, we expanded on the concept supporting, for example, the National Cybersecurity Week. And some of our hosting companies started offering factory tours. We also had an AI machine learning awareness session on the bus, which was so successful that we were asked to repeat it as an internal workshop at a local manufacturing company who attended the event. Although I've mentioned now several times that Luxembourg is a small country, it still is a considerable investment especially for an SME to come to see us the LDIH at our premises this is where the idea of the DIH on tour came from we would visit them at their location therefore making ourselves more easily accessible to them and with the aim of better understanding their specific needs and requirements when it comes to digital transformation As a small side note, at the start of this year, we also held a feedback workshop in addition to our surveys, where we invited past participants of the DIH on tour and other of our activities to give us their ideas and input on the event in person. Involving our ecosystem directly helped us shape this year's program. Additionally, now being an EDIH and having the support of the European Commission, we were able to put many of our community's feedback and wishes into action and expand upon our DIH on tour program with more tailored and relevant content. This is the program of this year's DIH on tour, which concluded just a few weeks ago. This year, we also involved two of our consortium partners, the Luxembourg House of Cybersecurity and the Competence Center of the University of Luxembourg, as well as hosting companies of varying sizes. Good year needs no introduction, I think. Seratisit is a local large company headquartered in Luxembourg, and Codipo is a local SME. As a result of the feedback workshop I mentioned earlier, we adapted some of the program. So we started off with the factory tour. Then after the tour, each hosting company held a presentation on related to the tour that we saw on a digital solution or a challenge they overcame to inspire their peers. And finally, not finally, then we had an awareness session on digital energy and sustainability management. And finally, we used the opportunity to inform the participants on the LDIH service catalog uh, before ending the day with a networking uh, cocktail on the bus. Here are some impressions of the DIH on tour. Um, we covered, for example, this year we covered a, a wide variety of different topics from digital twins, used the entire testing and design to informing companies about open source uh, cybersecurity tools freely available to product and supply chain traceability apps using blockchain technology designed and implemented by a local SME to presentations on IT and OT infrastructure connecting production for factories up to the office in a factory using over 800 different machines of varying ages. Our audience was composed of manufacturers from staff to CXO level, enablers, people working in research and academia, as well as public administrations and training providers. It's not without challenges, a trend we have noticed in the past couple of years is that we are having, we are attracting more and more providers, tipping the ratio of manufacturing companies and providers. Um, so our next step is definitely to look at what might the, be the cause of that, get back to the drawing board, 
brainstorm and iterate upon the format of the event and make sure we are indeed reaching and engaging the manufacturing community as we have intended, as well as continuously improving um, the delivery of our services. Before wrapping up, I wanted to leave you with some key takeaways that we have learned during our outreach activities and especially with this event, the DIH on Tour event. First, it is crucial to know your ecosystem, to be able to address it and reach it through the right format. Being proactive is key as well. The first year of the tour, we were almost unknown as a hub, but this rather simple idea of taking a big yellow bus, but still out of the way approach made the LDIH known across the country. And going through, going to the manufacturing companies directly, meeting them at their premises, that sent a powerful message. Then there is really only one may, way to make sure that you are addressing the needs of your community effectively, and that is to ask for feedback, ask for it often and regularly, and then listen. Based on that feedback, you can then take action and iterate upon your outreach activities to make sure you are indeed doing your very best to meet their unique needs, as well as accompany them on their digital transformation journey towards a more sustainable, innovative and digital future. Thank you all for listening. And thank you again for giving us the opportunity and platform to tell you about our activities and to show you how we are making an impact on a local ecosystem. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take these now. Thank you very much, Lynn. I must say that I absolutely am a fan of the yellow bus uh, idea. I think it's a brilliant idea. And as you have shown, it clearly, clearly works. In fact, one of the questions that we had here on Slido, but I think you actually responded to it was whether companies have to come to you or you go to the companies. Well, you don't really go, you drive. <laughs> But, uh, but indeed, uh, that it's, it's amazing this, this proactive uh, approach that you are having. But there was a kind of uh, link to it question, whether, com the, whether there are any barriers for the companies in terms of access to the hub. Do you see any? Yes, I think for SMEs, barriers might be time. You mentioned it, the staff and the funds, um, depending on where they are located, even in such a small country such as Luxembourg, it can still be a considerable time investment and not every, especially SMEs, they cannot afford or they don't have the time or they don't see it, the, the return on investment on coming to approach us. Uh, so I think that is definitely um, an idea that we should challenge and change. Yes, uh, I, I would like to add something on that as well. Uh, what we often see, and it's it's the same with the generic innovation, is that unfortunately most companies still believe that they don't really need it or that they're not really concerned about it. So a whole big part of the activity is also um, making this information available and so that they are aware that even on their level or at any kind of level, there is a potential impact. And that's why I think these, these events, when you have like one too many or one too few, then they, they feel more comfortable already by sitting there with their peers. And then we can share some generic information. And it's out of that, that then we can go and dig into the details. But you have to have a lot of availability and open-minded. And then the best cases is always if it's one of them that presents how successful it was for them to do the change. And then they come back to us and they ask questions. So, I mean, this is all great, but it also proves that there is a lot of work almost at individual level to really reach out to this company to convince them that uh, you have a solution for them and that's going to work for them and it's worth the, the initial input which has to be there because without that, unfortunately, it's not going to work. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn and, and Benjamin. And we will uh, have still a round of questions after all the presentations. But now let me pass the floor to Erwin and to Juren from, uh, from the Netherlands uh, and uh, to present as the hub NWNL. 
Erwin, I think you are launching the presentation. Yes, just a second. Please let me know if you see it. Yes, it's all good. It's all good, okay. Thank you very much. And I'm also very happy to, to be able to, to share our first experiences with the um, with the digital hub that we that we started. Uh, my name is Erwin van Eyden. My home base is the digital development uh, uh, agency in Utrecht in the, in the Netherlands. And uh, the, our agency is also the lead um, beneficiary of our EDI. And um, so I'm, 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 and I'm the program manager there. We are a uh, group of nine consortium of partners obviously a knowledge institutes uh, some branch organizations in the in manufacturing and uh, together we are running this uh, this eddy started from scratch first of december last last year um i have only one slide to show you and to give you a snapshot of what our eddy is uh, is about um Nikoska already gave you an introduction of what the eddy is are doing so we work, let's say, basically in the region uh, north northwestern the Netherlands, and so that's North Holland the province here that also includes Amsterdam. It's it's Utrecht, including the beautiful city of Utrecht and uh, and the province of uh, of Flevoland. This is a quite, let's say, diverse region when it comes to, let's say, the specific uh, industries that we are, are covering there. So when you look at the industry focus, you see indeed uh, four, well, very various uh, uh, domains. So we have agri-food that we are working on and trying to address the smart media, uh, smart industry, obviously, that is, I think, in most of the eddies, uh, a, one of the topics, and also urban health, which is basically about, let's say, a healthy and a good environment for people uh, for people to live in. So that is a wide wide range of, of topics that we uh, that we uh, cover, and still people asking for more. So it's always an, an, a trick and a challenge to focus and and not to to go too wide. At the same time, we are open to any let's say good question from from an SME. Uh, when you look at the SMEs, so it's basically 10 to 250 uh, FTE. Yeah? So that's our main focus when you when you look at uh, who are we uh, who are we targeting. Again, there, some smaller, some bigger are also welcome if they have any interesting digital challenges. But when you look at the main focus, we believe in our region that we can have the most impact in organizations with, uh, with this size. From a technology point of view, I see this is something that you see a lot, of course, also in the, in the eddies. It's artificial intelligence and high performance computing. And I believe high performance computing is basically more like a, a infrastructure support system uh, for the AI uh, uh, applications uh, to, to be able to run. So that's more like the targets that we have when you look then at the services. So indeed, we have uh, uh, a test before invest. So working hard on proof of concepts and, and getting uh, the uh, the first uh, and making the first steps uh, for the for the for the companies and really learn them and give them experience of what can AI in this matter mean for them for, for their business before actually doing the uh, the big investments training and development of course uh, that's that's obvious so it's it's really important to get to get employees on a, on a higher level when it comes to to digital uh, technologies. We get a lot of questions from companies that because as soon as they see something like investment on your on your website or finance, they easily jump in and then want to, they expect us to actually invest. Well, that's not what we do as Eddie, obviously, but we have a a group of experts that help us to find the best way for subsidies or other other means of of investments to really get the project running in the second stage so they can really have a big implementation but they need uh, money for that and um so let's say for for testing and training it's really scouting for for smes but when it comes to access to finance people find us immediately because that is apparently something that is really important to them and they know the way to find us uh, to, to us um then we have let's say network internationalization that's already mentioned was so really important for us to 
to be able and to unlock for for the SMEs the uh, uh, the peers and, and 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 in supply chain and experts and of course we are hopefully the gateway to, to Europe when it comes to, to these kinds of, uh, of questions. So that's basically is a snapshot of the Eddy in the northwest region of of the Netherlands. Um, one of the, uh, uh, the, the the consortium partners is uh, the University of Applied Sciences in uh, in Amsterdam, and uh, Jurian Helmers is, is one of the, the leading partners uh, there. Um, I'm not sure if we take questions now or that we wait after uh, Jurian has done his uh, talk uh, with Oscar. Um, we uh, generally will take them after, but uh, maybe let me just ask one question, uh, because uh, your Eddy specializes in smart media, uh, while Eddy is in general, the 150 plus the seals of excellence or so over 200 cover basically all sectors, not all sectors are equally popular. Manufacturing, as you said, almost everybody does it. AI, everybody, it's technology, but still. Um, and other things are more niche. Could you tell us a little bit more what your hub does uh, for the for the media sector? Well, we have one expert within a company within a consortium that's very much on uh, on, on serious gaming, and they have all sorts of applications in that uh, respect. And so we are developing that, and that's let's say the, the the main focus. So that is, and that's also something, of course, that you can use within an industry uh, from whatever domain. But when it comes to technology, uh, smart media is is an important uh, part of it. And at the same time, media is is a bit of an um, maybe more difficult domain to to address. And so the number of uh, of questions in that respect are, are low, to, to, to be all honest, in that respect. So when it comes to, to smart industry, we have may, may, uh, much more traffic than when it comes to smart media. But we still believe that we have some uh, so, some uh, um, uh, well, some big steps to make, but also that we can we, we can be successful there. But I assume that is more something for the long term. Thank you. Um, there is one other addict in addict in Croatia, for example, who also works a little bit on this uh, on this angle of media. They even recently changed name to uh, to reflect that. So I think there is future uh, in this in this area, and uh, yes, let's hope uh, it will it will develop further. Um, um, let's. Uh, I will um, ask you more questions uh, later on. And uh, now uh, let me remind everybody that the slider is there for questions. So please, uh, please uh, put them in. And uh, one of the questions uh, we got is how did the non-tech industries receive the EDAHS? And actually, uh, Barbara and Ruta will present a case of uh, of such a situation where a non-tech non-tech uh, company was getting support on uh, on becoming more digital. So Barbara and Ruta, please. That's the floor is yours. Ah, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What a she drama. You said Tiffany uh, some way. Yes, <laughs> I, I was surprised. I, I, I am really sorry. I, no, was, I kind of, oh, um... I, I in fact was surprised that Erwin was so short. <laughs> I, uh, I just want to add to uh, Aaron's uh, uh, answer on the media. There is a media AI and democracy lab uh, run by uh, the University of Applied Sciences as well, and we, which we also take into account uh, projects on uh, deepfakes and doing uh, privacy preserving and um, responsible AI in uh, for the media, where for the Dutch, uh, Dutch public uh, uh, media as well. But it's not part of specifically part of the uh, ADH, uh, ED, ED that we run, but it's more of a part of the uh, what we do at, at the University of Applied Sciences. So there, is, there are several projects uh, being uh, done right now. Um, let me uh, continue about uh, our AI, HPC and data uh, part. Um, so um, my name is Jurian Helmus. I work at the University of Applied Sciences as a senior lecturer, lecturer and um, I work in the field of AI for several years, and what I typically tend to see in, um, in the field of AI is that companies, small and medium enterprises, they they work in a threefold way. You first have to demonstrate how things work, work for them, make proof of concept iteratively, 
then work together in projects, e.g. from a proof of concept to a, to a media, medium sized, medium, medium mature proje uh, project, and then they have to do it themselves in, the, in relation to us. Um, a lot of SMEs find it very difficult to, to, to start with, uh, with uh, AI themselves in, in an early stage, um, not only because of the, the issues in the, uh, the employment uh, in the Netherlands, uh, there's a lot of old uh, employees in the technical sector, but also since AI is typically a crossover between IT and uh, domain knowledge. Um, and IT projects always tend to, uh, to, to do longer and are uh, past budget uh, in the, uh, even before you get started. So that's why a lot of companies are hesitant to, to work on the AI. But then as a context, what we see, and that's very interesting, is a few new technologies coming up and um, uh, several trends in, in house trends that are very interesting for Dutch, uh, Dutch or even worldwide small and medium enterprises. Um, uh, for instance, um, what we see is, is a lot of companies that tend to push AI from a centered uh, idea. From, so all data flows from uh, sensors to a central uh, computing cent uh, center where they run in the Google Cloud or any, any other cloud, their algorithms. We see a, a tendency for companies to skip the edge, to skip the cloud and go back to the edge with cheap uh, edge devices um, that we, we use. And it helps companies to, to scale up and to, to uh, deploy AI much faster at, at a reduced price. Uh, for instance, we have now a, uh, a company we helped uh, the, with the business case. Uh, the, the whole project costed 500 euros in hardware. Uh, whereas if you put up a Google Cloud or any other cloud, you would have 25K only on the FTE spent for uh, such a project. So this is what we tend to see. And what you also tend to see is that companies much more are willing to have these AI algorithms in production. So not only having the proof of concept ready, but also uh, after proof of concept, we uh, are willing to implement them in their organization. And in the end, what you see is a lot of uh, companies, tech providers are delivering low code tooling, such as now no program needed, click drag and drop, and you have to, you make your own algorithm. Uh, Microsoft is keen on it, but also other companies are keen on it. And in the half year, University of Applied Sciences, we tend to, to some way uh, work with these common technologies to help SMEs with their issues rather than having the academic view uh, and using uh, complex technologies. What helps in AI is to boil down to essentially the essence to where the business case is. And the business case for AI is typically in making better decisions. And now I, I do skip the the whole idea of generative AI and large language models. I, I'll come back to that later. But in essence, if you ask companies what kind of decision would you like to improve, is it on in efficiency? Is it in production? Is it on 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 um, on uh, uh, new getting new customers or on uh, maintenance? Then you boil down the 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 typical decision, and these decisions are always in a, in a few uh, aspects, always in precisity, yeah, how precise is your decision right now? How accurate are you now in time? So how, when do you make these decisions and can we make them earlier rather than making them too late? And completeness, can we make a, a simple decision, not only for one customer machine asset, can we make them for a bunch of assets and, uh, and machines for uh, our customers, for a group? And this is where, where, where we, we find SMEs being uh, a touch in their heart, in their soul, in their business model. This is what helps them to think about, okay, this is why I want to have AI, not as a large project, a, 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 a large project, but just as a small sub-project sub in, uh, in their organization. And in order to, to, to run AI in a, a technical context compared to the financial services or, or media, we always talk about the physical world, machineries, uh, products, uh, or even health is all about physical world, the physical assets, physical machines, the physical products. So you need to have a, 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 a good grab of the, the, the chain from the physical world through the sensors, data sources, in the end to where you want to run your algorithms and which algorithms, of course. 
And and what we do with companies, we 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 on one hand, if they have that chain from from the physical world from their machinery to the data sources is already yeah, finished, is is present, then we we go directly to the AI part. If there's no budget for a a complex, large, real uh, real time type of of um, of uh, of uh, digital chain, we'd use the tiny machine learning uh, ideas to to run with cheap devices from the uh, in their physical world and run algorithms there so this is what we do we, we present to companies where are you in your maturity on this chain and how can we help you and where is your first uh, question on uh, on the on the on the on the uh, on your on your ai related question right with, for the business case uh, and all these, 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 uh, the data chains has all kinds of technologies. So for instance, sensors, the physical world, the gateways, the security, uh, AI. And then and I was, just want to show you some short uh, terms you see here, like uh, 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 Python uh, using in AI, um, uh, the data lake you need, and the supercomputers you need to uh, to calculate. So this is all the concept, all the things we have in our digital innovation hub that we use in our uh, herb as part of the the, the 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 solutions we deliver to the companies and well, as i said one of these solutions is tiny machine learning and it's the whole concept of tiny machine learning is that we we push the data and the algorithms all in these small edge devices like you see here in the in the, in the right uh, corner uh that doesn't require a cloud computer. That doesn't require uh, uh, a lot of IT problems, uh, uh, cybersecurity, because all local stored uh, on your uh, your system. And here we can help uh, real time uh, with for a low budget uh, companies with their uh, the questions uh, rather than uh, putting up these large projects. And we can also speed up these projects rather than having a, a few years of uh, of uh, of uh, data gathering. But this is uh, the use case that we uh, that's really interesting. And what we do here with a uh, small medium enterprise is uh, freeze and data. They they uh, have uh, cooling installations. They deliver cooling installations such as these industrial cooling installations for not only um, only uh, 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 enterprises for uh, hospitals. They deliver it for uh, for uh, 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 all kinds of services, and they now with us gather data about these these uh these cooling installations and um what we do we have here in our lab where i'm right now right now present a, a uh, this cooling installation as well and we we bought it from the from the from the from piece of data and what we do is we put it in mal into malfunctioning mode while generating new data we have it as a demonstrator in our lab um and we run it as a as a a system where we, we, we close the pump, we close the, the, the lines, we close the valves uh, to get it to in, really into malfunctioning mode. We get a data from the cooling machine uh, in our experiments and run algorithms to, to in this case, um, uh, uh, predict whether the, the malfunction will occur or not. Using our data, using our mockup of the system, we are able to help other companies with their, uh, with their problems. So, for instance, there's a hospital in Rotterdam, uh, in the southern of the Netherlands. Uh, they had issues with their uh, medical the, uh, cooling machine, and uh, medical cooling machines is it's a matter of life and death. If there's uh, issues with the cooling machine, then um, in uh, that case, the, the medicines or the bio uh, biomedical uh, uh, material like tissues uh, they are not preserved. So you need a cooling machine that's continuously running. And they had issues with the cooling machine, and uh, in the start situation, the cooling machine. Uh, if it failed uh, only after 40 minutes, uh, the, the the service engineers get a sense of when it's when, when it failed. What we did is we we mimicked the uh, the failure, failing mechanisms in our lab with uh, our data that we gathered, and now we run algorithms and are able to within uh, one and a half hour, more than one and a half hour, we are able to um, to predict this in real life in real uh, in the in real sense in a, in a safe and secure manner this is such a unique project that we had uh, the queen of the netherlands a few weeks ago in our lab talking about uh, this EDA, uh, european digital innovation project about how we run these projects with mockups in our uh, in our labs this is me talking to the queen uh, on the right side and this is how we help these small medium enterprises with their their issues 
Uh, one of the other things that we now do is uh, we there's a lot of problems with uh, employees in the Netherlands, technical uh, skilled employees. So what we also do is we combine the physical uh, um, uh, uh, system that we have with all kinds of service manuals in a large language models together with uh, now with Surfsara, the supercomputing center in the Netherlands, uh, to make a large language model that's able to help uh, service engineers with their questions if they're in inexperienced. And this is the Dutch version, and you can ask a question to the uh, to the system and ask, oh, my the compressor is not working. Can you help me out? And based on the manuals that we put in the system, you get an answer. Hey, look at this, look at this. Maybe we can help you out. So we are able to include uh, uh, knowledge from experienced uh, service engineers that are going to uh, do, to the that are old and are, 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 are turning off their work the, to the, uh, the young engineers in the work fields. And this is really, really a new type of uh, development that you see in the generative AI world. Finally, what we do is uh, we um, we made, made algorithms and I hope this works. Yeah, uh, this is this is really impressive. It's a new technology what we developed um, um, together with uh, uh, the university. What you see on the oh, what you see on the uh, left side is what your eye sees. Uh, what we see on the right side is motion amplification. We are able with our cool, our, our algorithms to amplify types of, of, uh, of vibrations to see visually when things fail. And you see on the right side, for instance, that the compressor is, uh, is highly uh, vibrating, but also the pot, the black pot on the, on the, on the, in the middle of the picture is uh, vibrating much more than you would expect. And we can help engineers with looking from the eyes of AI to look at how uh, things fail, when things fail, assets, for instance, in this case, and help them out. Hey, this is how you can improve design of these uh, these assets, and this is how you can improve um, the uh, longevity uh, of the assets, um, and help them out with this. So these are uh, our typical building blocks that we work up upon in our uh, European Digital Innovation Hub. On one hand, the tiny machine learning. On the other hand, the digital twins. And this is another case where we work on uh, on um, on the seeing what AI sees rather than what your normal eyes uh, sees. And we are working on the large language models. Um, I hope it now closes. Um, yeah, so these are the building blocks that we, we work on in, uh, in our lab. Physical, all physical, all with sensors, devices, large language models, and uh, uh, mockups for companies that put their assets here in our lab and uh, uh, large collaborations. So if you have any questions on this, uh, this subject, uh, please go ahead. I'm more than willing to share all of it including the algorithms that we uh, develop because it's all open uh, for anyone to, uh, to use. Thank you very much. And sorry again for <laughs> trying to cut you out. We would have missed a really great presentation and a very, very interesting case. I have a question a little bit on the other side. Has it ever happened that a company came to you and demanded an AI solution while something else uh, was actually what they would need first or something? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. So the answer is not always AI. That's that's true. The rule by, there are always rule-based systems that also work. So and what you see in for these companies, it's very important. That that's what we discussed with the Queen as well. Um, if a company doesn't know what it doesn't know, then there's there cannot be a question. They don't know. So there is something. Can you help me with something? And what we now tend to do is to collaboratively with these companies uh, put their assets here with us in the in in the lab and look at how we can help them out with these uh, these failing, failing mechanisms, for instance, with workshops and get them insights. And, okay, yeah, this is the real question that I have. And then we look at whether AI can be a solution. It's not always a solution, of course. It's not a, it's not a, a, it's a buzzword, it's a hype, but it's not always a solution. <laughs> but when it is a solution, it's a great solution. <laughs> It can be a great solution, but if, uh, so AI is, so for instance, AI is statistically based. It's always statistics. If you would, ha would, would have a parachute or a, or, or a, um, uh, an airplane that's automatically uh, landing, if it's statistically uh, AI driven, then it will fail sometimes because there's never an accuracy of 100%. So some systems you don't want to have AI. You want to simply have a rule-based system that you understand the system and from the understanding of the system, create rules how to steer, for instance, how an airplane lands. And you won't want to do it in the, in the terms of AI because it's statistics. Mm. 
Thank you very much. I think it's very important and it really underlines the role of the of the EDIHS that is to help the concrete uh, issues that the concrete company has. It's not to solve all problems or AI problems or whatever, or not even to sell the uh, sell in the sense, promote uh, AI solutions, but really to help to help a company with with their issues. Thank you very much. We'll come back with some further questions. Colleagues, don't hesitate uh, to put your questions in Slido. And now I will give <laughs> the floor to Ruta and Barbara with the low-tech company's uh, journey to digital excellence. Thank you very much for the introduction and indeed also the chance to present our study. Um, as uh, my colleague uh, shares the presentation, I will do a quick intro. Uh, so my name is Ruth and I'm joined today by my colleague Barbara and we are both representing PPMI, which is a policy research institute and consultancy based in Vilnius, Lithuania. So today we will introduce a project we implemented uh, for DG Connect uh, of the European Commission called Smart Industrial Remoting. And I will start with an overview of the project and my colleague will explain to you and present to you a specific case study uh, of a small farm from Lithuania, uh, which we supported during the project, which indeed does not come from a digitalized industry and was not very digitalized when the piloting process be began. So. Uh, starting with the project itself, uh, the objective of the smart industrial remoting study was to provide, uh, provide user friendly and targeted advice to both companies, as well as their supporting ecosystems, which of course also include the digital innovation hubs uh, that support companies. Uh, the study that we implemented especially focused on SMEs and companies of low digital maturity, as well as industries of low digitalization level overall, and that were hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you can see, uh, we chose five ecosystems that we analyzed in more depth within the study. And these were construction industry in Romania, textile sector in Portugal, retail in Poland, automotive industry in Hungary, and agri-food in Lithuania. So these were the ones that we analyzed in more depth. However, a lot of our findings and a lot of the study outputs are a bit more horizontal in nature and we hope also applicable beyond the target groups that we addressed. Um, so continuing on uh, with what we actually did in the study, our study had five key steps. <clears throat> I apologize. Uh, the first was gap analysis. Uh, then we identified the key problems uh, for these companies to digitalize. Uh, we collected best practices uh, from different you know, companies in different sectors all across Europe. And then once those best practices were collected, we wanted to test them in real life settings by uh, piloting these um, best practices in five companies. And finally, we produced the final output of the study, the digitalization toolbox. Uh, the study is now completed. We actually completed the study during the summer. So all of these outputs are available and you can explore them uh, after this presentation as well. Um, as a horizontal activity, also, we held various workshops and disseminated the findings to a wider audience. So those were the key elements of the study. So moving on to the study team. So as I mentioned, the study was implemented by PPMI. Uh, however, the integral element of our success within the study was our close collaboration with digital innovation hubs in each of the chosen five ecosystems. Uh, they not only helped us garner valuable insights from each of the ecosystems specifically, but they also were the ones who were guiding the companies through the piloting phase. So this is why uh, we are presenting the case study today, um, because it's a great example of how a digital innovation hub can really help a company uh, advance in their digitalization journey, even if they are not uh, very digitally mature in the very beginning. So moving on to uh, actually also the, the overall observation of, uh, of what the digital innovation hub network can do for companies. So apart from the hub's direct involvement and what we observed, we also in various stages did surveys or asked our participants at workshops, what are the key elements they struggle with as well as what types of support they think is the most important. Uh, what is quite interesting in our study is that we saw 
that of course digital innovation hubs can be a really powerful tool for helping companies advance in their digitalization journeys and this is especially true because a lot of the challenges despite companies coming from different industries implementing very different technologies um, and having very different backgrounds uh, and digital maturities a lot of the struggles they have are the same. A lot of them, as mentioned also by previous speakers, concern things like skills and having the, and the right resources and the right expertise to actually uh, go forward in their digitalization journeys. And of course, with the least digitalized companies, a key element is also figuring out where to start and why to start and what the business value of digital transformation is. So the digital innovation hubs can really play a, an important role in trying to convince the companies that digitalization is both worth it and how to actually start the process to begin with. Um, so then going on, before we get into a specific example, I wanted to also introduce the context within which uh, the case study that my colleague will present in more depth happened. So a bit about the piloting phase that we actually did. Um, so after we did our research and identified best practices for digital transformation, we had to test whether these best practices actually work in practice. So um, as part of the study, we implemented five, six months long pilots with companies uh, that were all SMEs at various stages of their digital maturity and each coming from a different ecosystem. Um, and they were supported by digital innovation hubs throughout this process. So going on to the five pilots that we actually had, um, as mentioned, so we had one in each of the ecosystems um, uh, that we analyzed in more depth. So we had an automotive company from Hungary, we had a retail company from Poland, a textile company from Portugal, uh, the small farm from Lithuania that we will uh, talk a bit more about later, and the construction company from Romania. Um, what I wanted to highlight with this slide as well is, even though all of the companies did very different things and implemented different technologies, the good news was that they're all success stories. Every single pilot managed to increase the digital maturity uh, during the piloting phase. Uh, and, you know, uh, as I give the floor to my colleague Barbora to tell you more about the Lithuanian pilot, incidentally, that was the company that had the biggest jump in its digital maturity during the piloting phase, actually, uh, you know, um, achieving quite a lot within a very short period of time, uh, even though it had also uh, one of the lowest digital maturities in the very beginning of the pilot. So, yes, Barbara, the floor is yours. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, so thank you, Ruta. I will actually then now zoom in to the specific Lithuanian case study of agri-food that I think uh, we are quite um, keen to share with you. Indeed, as Ruta mentioned, this was the company that had the lowest uh, digital maturity at the beginning. Um, of the pilot. Um, this pilot was implemented by our Lithuanian uh, hub, AgriFood Lithuania, um, together with their service provider R21 that is part of the hub's uh, consortium. Um, and the company was selected by the hub as the hub was already aware of this company. They have collaborated with the, with the hub in a previous um, context, um, but the, the previous collaboration was not linked to digitalization, it was more focusing on its entrepreneurship more broadly. Um, and in this case, the company was motivated to digitalize because it's a family run farm. Um, it's husband and wife running the farm. And uh, a lot of the, well, most of the management and planning related activities at the farm were done manually. Um, there were Excel forms, but also a lot of paper forms um, being completed uh, by the farmer. Um, and they really wanted to have a more streamlined farm with better crop. Um, and also client management tools. And why I say crop and client management is also because this is a zero waste farm, um, which is a really new farm. It's quite small, it's 50 acres. And the farmer stresses that uh, for them, they have their own crops uh, that they produce, but they also take um, produce that's not fit for sale from other nearly farms. Um, and they repurpose it into products such as um, oils, vinegars, um, jams, spices, et cetera. So they have these, the client management side, the supplier management side, as well as their crop uh, management side. So they were curious to explore digitalization because for uh, it being a, a small family run farm, 
um, all of these different work streams were getting a little bit overwhelming. Um, so for this reason, the chosen solution to implement at the farm was uh, AgroSmart Farm Management Software. It's a tool for data and quantity and quality management of the farm that has several functionalities, including production, forecasting, um, several different layers of farm maps and aerial maps. Um, you can also plan uh, your pr production, managing operations, and finally also as an accounting function in in the application. Uh, one of the challenges, and I think as you hear, we'll hear quickly one of the biggest learning curves for both the farm but also the hub um, was that this was the first time the solution was used um, in a micro farm. This is usually a software that's used by large farms. Um, and some of the challenges that the farm encountered, I think, was also associated with um, some of the complexities of the system being implemented. Um, and so the hub and the service provider really played a crucial role in this pilot as they um, worked really closely with the farmer. It was quite a resource intense pilot as they had to provide a lot of technical consultations, um, supporting the farmer in actually grasping the benefits of the technology. Um, and actually really supporting the farmer in uploading all the necessary data um, into the software. Now, maybe looking a little bit um, at the steps of the actual digital intervention, as mentioned by Ruta, this was a six month project um, with the actual uh, work beginning in October or November. Um, and as we saw from the hubs that we surveyed, uh, usually this definition of a digital transformation plan is really a key step um, and as also as we heard, some companies uh, come with their request for artificial intelligence, but actually there's also a lot of homework that needs to be done beforehand. So this was really a crucial step for the hub and for the farm to really understand what type of data the farmer has, what type of processes it goes through every day, who are the suppliers, who are the clients in the farm to really understand how the software can help the farmer and to tailor as well. So in this case, uh, digital maturity was done. We also did a digital maturity assessment for the purpose of the study to take stock of farms digital skills and digital maturity then there was analysis of the farms needs um, and also this technical feasibility to assess which functions of the app uh, of the software are useful for the farmer because it's 50 acres farm uh, they have a few greenhouses um, as well, so a lot of the functionalities uh, that are linked to larger farms were not relevant for the farmer, so the system was uh, tailored. Certain modules were deactivated for the farmer, um, and as such, they developed a tailored deployment uh, plan for the farm. And uh, this fifth step, which is the implementation of the solution uh, at the farm, is actually, it's step five, but I would say it was the longest and the most important step, because in this stage, uh, the farmer was, as I mentioned, mapping all of the data on the farm and uploading it manually into the system. And this is the step that took the longest. Um, and it's also where the farm really um, reached out, so to speak, quite a lot to the hub to um, ask some questions, so to speak, because I think for the farmer, it was uh, quite an increase in workload associated with the step of actually implementing the system. Um, and once that took place, um, there was continuous monitoring and improvement. Um, as I mentioned, the system was actually implemented between um, February, uh, between January and March, which is the low season, so to speak, in agriculture. So that was really useful because the farmer could upload the data and then start testing the system over the summer. As if these periods were overlapping, it would have been much more tricky for the farmer to find the time to actually implement the system um, and, and use it. So then going into the actual uh, results of the, and that maybe more important the lessons learned of the pilot is that um, the data was successfully uploaded. Uh, the farmer could also map its suppliers so it could better time and plan when it can repurpose the products being supplied to it from other farms. Um, they could also track their recipes as well because the farmer, she shared very honestly that she just comes up with recipes based on inspiration. Um, and this tool also allows her to track these recipes and to repurpose them as well um, in the future. And one uh, very inspiring thing was that the farmer was really excited uh, by the tool once it saw its functionalities and it's now willing to pursue further digitalization. 
Um, it even mentioned that they're interested in using robots in the farm. However, we believe, and the farmer says there's probably quite a long way to go before that is feasible, yet um, they, do be, they did become this proponent of digitalization. What is important here to highlight is that um, one of the KPIs for this farm was actually to spend less time on farm management and more time with their family members, with their children. During the pilot implementation, the farmer actually spent more time on farm management because they had to upload the data into the system and learn how to use the system. And this is a, a really, I think, crucial moment to take away when working with companies of low digital maturity is that there is this drop in productivity and there is a learning curve um, that any company has to go through. Um, and in that case, this helps persistence and helps guidance in making sure the company acquires the necessary knowledge, acquires the necessary, the necessary skills um, is really key uh, because on the other side, we have now uh, a farm that's really excited by digitalization that is using the system, um, but that did require quite a lot of um, metaphorical handholding from the hub to support the farm in this regard. Um, and as I mentioned, indeed, um, there was a lot of one-on-one -on -one trainings, um, and now the farm uh, is quite keen to participate in other initiatives. And as we heard from the hub, is now also participating um, in another farm. Uh, so I will stop here. Um, I believe the presentations will be shared with everyone uh, later, so you can also read about the study um, in the published. Um, results. And I'm also, uh, we'll leave now the floor to some questions as usually um, have some related to this. Thank you very much. Um, you have uh, mentioned uh, quite a lot the digital matur maturity assessment, which is uh, a tool that the hubs use to assess the, the, the digitalization level of a company, let's say at the starting point, and in principle also at the end of the, of the service. And the question here is um, whether it is more difficult to, to achieve higher progress if the company starts from a, from a higher score. Uh, would you agree to that, that it's more difficult to be more digitalized, <laughs> to increase your score on that? So our sample is extremely small. Uh, we had only five companies that we worked at, so you know any answers that we give is based on a very small sample. Uh, but I think actually looking at the specific farm, um, because they implemented a tool, they did uh, tick. Uh, with one tool, they actually ticked quite a lot of dimensions of the digital maturity assessment. Um, in, in particular, uh, the business strategy dimension, because actually they develop a strategy together with the hub, uh, similarly digital readiness, um, and just in general data management approach. Um, a lot of these tools were actually implemented with one system, and then that actually ticks several um, boxes, even such as human centered digitalization. There were also some uh, skills, a lot of that were developed in this case. Um, in the context of these more mature companies that we have uh, here, um, indeed, the, the increases were smaller because the companies have a lot of the processes already implemented. Um, and what they do, they usually continue either streamlining, implementing, or adding more tools. Uh, but they usually they don't start um, from scratch uh, per se. At least this was the case that we observed um, in our pilots. Thank you very much. Uh, so, colleagues, um, I invite you again to to ask your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Barbara and and Ruta. And uh, I will now um, open the floor for uh, all po all panelists. And uh, we have a question concerning uh, communication. Uh, what do you think is the biggest issue in terms of communicating the activities of the hubs? Uh, to the companies, I presume, and um, maybe uh, we would start with uh, with uh, Lynn and uh, and Benjamin, since they have that kind of the bus idea. I would say one of the main challenges to communicate is to reach the very S part of the SMEs and to mm -hmm. make sure that we get outside of our Kind of bubble of existing kind of network um so we we really have to kind of be even more proactive in, in that regard 
Uh, yes, I'm totally aligned on that. And uh, so it's really, really the, the, uh, reaching out to the very small ones. And that means using their own communication mechanisms. And that's, as I said before, it's more peer to peer or going to visit them and having success stories to share that that's very efficient. And then another very important point about how to communicate with people is that uh, with any kind of organization, usually you get the usual suspects back. You know, people were happy that come back, et cetera, et cetera. So the real question is, and also, how do you reach the new ones? That's, uh, well, that's just something that we try to have in mind as much as possible. And it's also by doing this mapping exercise that you can find on our website. I think it's quite interesting because having like someone independent of the daily job doing this mapping exercise and really looking at what, what, what is really present in your ecosystem. And then you can start to do like any sales companies start to segment the population. Anybody else would like to add something on this? I would like to add, add something, Erwin here. Um, well, on a positive side, what I think works really well, that is to use already existing, let's say, networks instead of doing because let's say we started with our eddy by scratch so let's say there's no brand knowledge about about eddy and the digital hub so it's better to just use existing networks uh, either being field labs or or uh, uh, entrepreneurial associations whatever and uh, uh, let's say do it within in, in that event let's say uh, present our activities and uh, when it comes to a challenge um because we got a lot of questions so uh, can you come and talk about the eddy and of course i understand the questions but talking about the eddy makes no sense of course uh, because <laughs> I, I can talk a lot about eddy but that's not, that's not interesting it's not about me at the same time when you are starting an initiative like this this is what you try to do huh? you, you, would, you would try to explain this is what we can do and this is what we can offer you and at the same time we, we offer a lot, but in the end, it's about what they need. And so that is always looking for, for that balance. And especially starting an eddy, it's a lot about talking about eddy, but that's not what I wanted to do. I just want to talk about the company and then see how we can connect and how we can contribute as, as eddy. This is, uh, this is a very interesting and um, F following on the on the example that uh, Barbara and and Ruta showed, um, this farm I, I like this example very much. It's very inspiring, but it's also clear how much work had to go into this. And in the end, it's just a two-person farm. I mean, it's not the next Google. <laughs> Let's face it. So. How are you working on this? How are you keeping this balance, you know, choosing maybe uh, even the companies? Uh, to, because obviously, you know, in the end, uh, we cannot help absolutely everybody. And here there was also effort to actually involve them, to, to, to convince them. So, so how to do it? Because uh, you and also Benjamin mentioned we need to reach out to the small ones, to those who haven't, who don't know us. How to strike this balance? Can I perhaps answer this question? Yes. So what I tend to do and to choose is um, if I look, I look forward to the results that we, that we will deliver to companies. And if I can reuse a framework of a result, for instance, these large language models, if I can have a, a architecture for a large language model that I now develop for a specific company, and I can reuse this large language model for another company, then we can have can the flywheel starts to to run. So looking beyond the results of your projects and what can we learn from it, and can we re, redo these projects again in a short amount of time for these smaller companies? That's one of the first things that I, that is helpful. The second th thing is. Um, don't talk to companies that don't need you. So, so, so I mean, there's a lot of 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 of, chit, of, of uh, uh, meetings that I have that do not end in in a help question or yeah, that's yeah, now, now now I know about the Eddie. Yeah, thanks, and, and we continue. So that's the, that's the other one. And the, the, the final thing is, um, uh, a lot of companies are looking for the same types of solutions. Push here, you get that. Click this button, you get that. You get this type of algorithm needed. 
here you so standardization of of solutions like predictive maintenance solutions or energy, energy optimization solutions help to develop them once and put them all all open source uh, for all kinds of companies uh, uh, available. So if you take into account these concepts, uh, then you can scale up your your eddy much faster than than um, than uh, focusing on one specific company and then going to the next project. We are uh, expected as the Eddy network to support uh, hundreds thousand companies by end of 2025, if I'm not mistaken. Do you think we're going to reach the number? Well, reach is a is a difficult question. What is reaching? Um, so, but if we provide, for instance, the, the, I showed you the video of motion amplification. Eh? It's, it's the video of the vibrating um, uh, thing. It's, it's AI. It's an AI solution. You can download the solution from our website and you can get it and, and use it. Uh, and as soon as companies see the solution, they say, oh, well, this is what I want. So we, we package it into a, 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 uh, a physical object, the proof of concept, and please use it. Then it scales and then we may reach this, this, this amount of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of SMEs. I don't want to monopolize you, but <laughs> but actually, um, is there a way of um, expanding this, scaling up these solutions? Uh, how can we promote it so that other people actually know that this is uh, that this is available? Um, so so. There is an active community in the AI data science digital world. There is an active community. Um, uh, and as soon as you support open source tooling that is interesting for, for companies, for medium enterprises, and you have a, a community of learners around it, for instance, uh, the, the C-suite of a company says, ah, you know, come here, uh, I, will, I will push my, push my, my employees to, to use it, to experiment with it, and I'll give you feedback. Uh, and and uh, the open source community takes into account these these um, these feedback, then uh, uh, then that, that helps to to scale up this uh, this this uh, these communities. And there's a lot of communities that we don't know about on specific subjects. Uh, uh, I can give you tens of websites. For instance, extra.io is very a very famous uh, website where you can make your own tiny machine learning devices you put them on a compressor or whatever you get the algorithms already run but a lot of people don't know what they don't know and if you're unknown in in this field then you don't know what to look for but there is a lot of things present yep. and we okay. do have the, the e-learning modules of course uh, that, that the dta is is hosting so we can do something there as well to to share it with other eddies well, that leads me to the last question to, to all of you, and I would really like all of you uh, to respond to it. What can we do to, to make your life uh, easier? We as the European Commission, as DigiConnect, and also partially as DTA, what, uh, what can we do to help you to, to make your life easier and uh, to, 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 to enable that we really reach these uh, 100,000 companies, ideally, but at least as many as we really can and to make a real change on the digital journey. So, so I'll start because uh, someone has to, but I think what, what really helps is, is the dissemination activities, is making people aware in all the areas and not only in the big cities, but also in the most more remote regions and share success stories. Success stories about companies who have the same kind of activities or who have a geographic proximity. And since the EDIHs are regional, regional ones, well, we could do some regional communication on these success stories, but also maybe bring success stories from another region to a third, to a second region, right? And so I think that would make, would already help a lot. And then uh, vulgarize or make aware the different technologies and what does it mean? I mean, when we talk about HPC, AI, I think between us, we more, know more or less how, what is doing what and how we could use it. But I think for most people in daily life, it's just the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Erwin, maybe you. <laughs> yes, well, I I feel that you're all already doing a lot to, to help us to make this to make this all work. And well, the easy answer, of course, is make it as, as simply simple as possible for us. But it is more on the admi administrative side, and we don't want to talk about that, I guess. But so. <laughs> The, the less time we spend on that, the more time we can spend on on on, on supporting the SMEs. But as, except for that, I I don't have a, another thing to add. So I think you're doing a good job so far. <laughs> okay, I take that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Barbara or Ruta, from your perspective. Sure. I, we are not, of course, representing a digital innovation hub, but we did talk to a lot of them through workshops and different uh, study activities. And the one thing that we kept hearing again and again that's really important is, of course, indeed, success stories and resources that can be made available. So something like the DTA's Knowledge Hub is a very valuable resource, and the more that can be added there, the better. Uh, especially since in our study, what we did see is even though every industry has its specifics and every company has its specifics, ultimately there is a lot of horizontal challenges that companies are facing, whether it's change management, risk management, whether it's planning and creating a roadmap for digitalization. So all of these things, I think, um, we kept hearing again and again in our study as being very important. Thank you very much. Um, so, as there are uh, no further questions uh, to us, I would like to thank you all again uh, for joining us uh, here today. It was really great to hear the real life stories of what you are doing on the ground and how you are reaching the companies and uh, changing them uh, in their digitalization journey. And uh, well, we are always there for you if anything is needed. And um, thank you very much. And I think we close uh, now. Uh, and uh, until next time, thank you.